so I'd like to introduce uh, Hannah Kawast, who's with us today, joining us today to discuss Canada's um, complicity in Palestinian dispossession and how it enables settler colonialism at home and abroad. Hannah is a Palestinian uh, activist, writer, and journalist who was born in Bethlehem, Palestine. Uh, he is a champion of the Canadian, he's a, he is a chair, he is chairperson of the Canadian Palestinian Association and uh, was co-host of Voice of Palestine. He has been active in anti-war struggles and support work for liberation movements uh, in, in countries around the world. So without anything further from uh, myself, Hannah, please take it away. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, really, I think uh, some people think that um, that threatening. I will hate to disappoint them, but I'll try my best. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'd like to go uh, uh, back to the original uh, topic, but before I go into it, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on unceded uh, land, indigenous land, and we are here as guests on this land, and we appreciate them allowing us to be on this land. Uh, the the settler colonialism all over the world, its main feature, it's, it is that it is supremacist, like any other uh, colonialist or imperialist venture all over the world. So they feel that other people are subhumans and they are deserved not to be treated equally. And so from this ideology, the settler colonialist ideology and all other colonialist and imperialist ideology, they look down upon the other nations, religions, races, etc. The, uh, you know, the, uh, what's happened in Palestine is similar to what happened in North America and in the Turtle Island. It is settler colonialists that denies the humanity of the other people who uh, are indigenous to this land. I just like to uh, post a clip from eight years ago uh, about We can't hear anything. Oh, you can't hear? Okay. I, I don't know what's happening because the audio function is not working, but I'll move on. Anyway, this, uh, this what I presented there is really the uh, eagle feather that were presented on us, to us from uh, our indigenous elder sisters in Vancouver, when the AFN, the uh, Assembly of First Nation, went to Israel, they assembled 26 delegates and they went to Israel. They gave us this, and really I consider this feather as uh, our passport and as our, uh, um, you know, a visa to this land. Having said that, you know, I'll, I'll move on. Really, the Zionist movement is settler colonialist. And I like to really quote from the first Zionist Congress before I go into the topic of Canadian complicity. Uh, but I'd like people to realize what is Zionism. And in the first Zionist Congress in 1897, which was held in Basel, Switzerland, the objective or one of the objective of this movement stated, and I quote, 
Zionism strives to create for the Jewish people a homeland in Palestine. Secured by public law, the Congress contemplate the following means to the attainment of this end. The promotion on suitable lines of the colonization of Palestine. The colonization of Palestine by Jewish agriculture and industrial workers. Also, Theodor Helzer, the founder of the political Zionism, wrote in his book, The Jewish State, which was published a year earlier than the First Zionist Congress in 1896, he said, We, and I'm quoting, we should there form a portion of the rampant of, against Asia an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. Sound familiar to our indigenous people here in North America? It sure it does, because that's how they looked at us as barbarians, while they thought that supremacist ideologies are civilized. You know, it shows you the sick mentality of the colonizer. Also, Hayim Wiseman, the president of the English Zionist Federation, said, and I'm quoting, a Jewish Palestine would be safeguard to England, in particular in respect to the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was then a French-British venture, and it was nationalized by Nasser in 1956. So they promised the uh, imperial power uh, and the British Empire that they will really guard their interest in the region. And that's really what Zionism is, settler colonialists that related to the bigger picture of uh, the colonialist uh, Europe. And it came about when the trend was to have settler colonialism uh, all, the, all over the world, including mainly in Africa, Algeria, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, South Africa, you name it. They were trying to uh, plant people there and at really high cost. Algeria lost 1.5 million people because of this French center, uh, settler colonialism that ironically came after the Second World War. So it's clearly, uh, you know, this colonialist ideology, the settler colonialist ideology wreaked havoc in the Third World and looked upon the other people as non-deserving or subhuman. In 1917, the British issued the Balfour Declaration. And the British, uh, uh, the secretary, British Foreign Secretary, Al uh, Arthur Balfour, issued this declaration basically promising to support a quote, national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. It's worth noting that in 1917, November 2nd, when the Balfour Declaration was issued, Britain didn't uh, occupy Palestine yet. They, they, they were at the end of the First World War and they were uh, allied with the Arab forces to defeat the Ottoman Empire. They weren't even there. And still they promised this land, the Palestinian land, to establish a Jewish homeland in it. Uh, the other thing I'd like to note, I'll try to get into Canadian role. The late Canadian Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, who, and I quote, was effusive with praise for Zionism when he addressed the Ottawa Convention of the Zionist Federation of Canada on July 4th, 1922, he applauded Britain efforts, basically the Balfour Declaration, in aid of the Zionist cause. He said that at the 
convention in Ottawa. And it's worth noting also that when he said that, Britain wasn't even, uh, uh, didn't get the mandate on Palestine by the League of Nations. So uh, it shows you, you know, the disregard for the humanity and the, uh, not just human rights, the, the national rights in their homeland of the Palestinian people, and shows you the racist uh, mentality behind such venture. I'll move to 1947-48, where uh, the former Prime Minister, Lester Pearson, he was then the Under Secretary of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, uh, in 1947. He was instrumental in ensuring the passage of the United Nations Partition Plan in 1947. Alongside Judge Rand, who really drafted the partition plan, which was the basis really, this partition plan was the basis for establishing the Zionist state in Palestine. Actually, you know, since mentioned Belfort Declaration, the Zionists were so grateful to Lester Pearson, who then became foreign minister and then the prime minister of Canada. They were so grateful that they called him the Belfort of Canada. That's, that's what the Zionists called him for his role in passing and formulating the partition plan. In, in 47, 48, more than 300 Canadians eventually joined the Israeli forces, while tons of military equi equipment from Harvard training aircraft to radio sets were smuggled out of Canadian ports. The Canadian government was reluctant to draw attention to this matter and refused to invoke the Foreign Enlistment Act in contravention of Canadian law and the UN embargo. Also, the Israeli small air force almost entirely was foreign, with at least 53 Canadian pilots who, who uh, were uh, conducting the ethnic cleansing on the Palestinian people then. So it's clearly, you know, the uh, uh, Canada, I, I, recently we hear a lot about the Foreign Enlistment Act because till now Canada allows uh, people to be recruited and go fight in the so-called IDF, we call it the IOF, uh, Israeli Occupation Forces. And, you know, the, uh, there is a, a, a lawsuit against that now. But, you know, it shows after 73 years, Canada still complicit in uh, uh, Israeli war crimes and is dedicated to the Zionist project. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about the ICC, I'll, I'll jump forward to the ICC, uh, International Criminal Court. Canada uh, took a very uh, 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 strong position against taking Israel to the ICC. And the, our question is, why not, if Israel is innocent of these war crimes, why not go and face justice if you are not guilty of these war crimes, but clearly Canada is trying to shield Israel from uh, these war crimes. I'll just, um, you know, uh, share with you uh, some uh, statement by the Minister of Foreign Affairs who uh, put a, who put a, a statement against, uh, you know, uh, the taking Israel to the uh, ICC. And here is the statement. And basically 
see saying because Palestine is not a state, then the ICC doesn't have the mandate. And just note that the creation of a Palestinian state can only be achieved through direct negotiations between the parties. I return to this sentence later, but show you that uh, the, uh, the support and the shielding of Israeli war crimes from uh, the Canadian government and from Canadian official position. You know, I also in um, the, uh, I like to go to the record of Canadian voting at the United Nations. Uh, since Harper came to power in 2013, uh, and in uh, the Liberal government in 2014, and up till now, they voted regularly against a resolution that called for, you know, from establishing uh, Palestinian sovereignty to right of return, you know, there is regularly, every year there is 19 or 20 resolution addressing Palestinian human and national rights. And Canada, since Harper came to power till now, votes against 18 or more, against 18 out of the 20 or 17 out of the 19, depending on the other, the, the other two, usually they abstain on this resolution. And we documented that on uh, our website for people who want to learn more, they could search on our website for Canadian position uh, at the UN, and you you'll get the record. It's really disturbing that such a government would uh, disregard human and national rights of a whole nation just because they support the uh, the Zionist project. You know, another example of the complicity of the Canadian government is, uh, you know, the IHRA, the uh, definition of anti-Semitism. It is now official that this IHRA is on the uh, record that Canada adopted it and uh, uh, the, the, let me get a screenshot here. Uh, they adopted the, this IRHA and, uh, you know, the, it became part in its institutional, uh, uh, document now. And it's institutional that this government takes a, a racist, uh, position against the Palestinian people, because the IHRA has seven of 11 uh, examples of anti-racism where they conflate Judaism with Israel and Zionism. And basically they're saying if you are, uh, if you question the legitimacy of the state of Israel or the ideology of Zionism, then you are anti-Semite. Actually, it's the other way around. Uh, the the uh, adopting such a policy does create anti-Semitism because you are conflating uh, uh, Judaism with Zionism. You are conflating Israeli war crimes with uh, the Jews and putting on the shoulder of the Jews all these war crimes, which is nonsense. And it's, it's proven that it is nonsense. Uh, the, uh, this is really, you know, uh, uh, I, I just like to go to uh, other subject. 
which is uh, the upper side nature of Zionism. The, uh, you know, we've been saying as Palestinian, this is a, a racist ideology and we are being treated uh, subhumanly and in a racist manner by uh, the Israeli uh, establishment and by the Israeli government. The uh, recently, you know, people were, you know, uh, reluctant to take our word for it. But recently, B'Tsalem, uh, beginning of this year, issued a, a report which says a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the, Mediter to the Mediterranean Sea. This is really important because, uh, you know, uh, it is coming from a Jewish organization inside Israel that uh, saying that uh, this, is, uh, this is apartheid. And I'll share this document with you. Uh, it is a Jewish a regime of Jewish supremacy from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. You can't really call them anti-Semites, <laughs> these people. I mean, they are mostly Jewish, and they are establishing that this is the regime that govern from the river to the sea, not just the West Bank, not just uh, Jerusalem, not just in, in the Gaza Strip, but all of historic Palestine. It's a regime of apartheid. Also, we, we, uh, we also uh, lucked out that the Human Rights Watch, which is usually serves the imperial interest of the empire, uh, issued a, another report where they established that, oh, the similar, similar, it was, I think, I believe it's, uh, it was um, more than 200 pages where they established, the report was 200 pages, where they established the same, the same, uh, uh, the, the same conclusion that Israel is an apartheid state. And this is the report, I shared it on the screen, a threshold crossed. And uh, they, it says uh, basically that Israel is an apartheid state, again, similar to um, the apartheid to, to apartheid in South Africa, and also it's not just again from uh, inside the occupied territory, but it's from the river to the sea in historic Palestine, including in Israel uh, proper. So uh, you know the this kind of uh, uh, irrefutable evidence that Israel apartheid state. And what is, uh, uh, what is uh, really apartheid means? Apartheid means simply racism. Israel is a racist state. Zionism is a racist state. You know, in, uh, uh, in uh, November 10th, 1975, the General Assembly resolved that Zionism is a form of racism. And, you know, two days later, uh, on uh, November 12th, at the House of Commons, we get a unanimous decision, unanimous decision to denounce this resolution by the, our parliamentarian at the House of Commons. It just, you know, shows you how disgusting is our politicians are, without exceptions. I mean, they all unanimously voted against this resolution, which is an established fact. To us, at least, the Palestinian is an established fact, and it's supported now by uh, B'Tsalem, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, and by Human Rights Watch. It's, I'd like just to compare it. A few years later, in 82, when the Sabra and Shatila massacre happened, and, you know, it was a gruesome massacre against the Palestinian refugee camps in Sabra and Shatila, uh, where was uh, uh, aided by the Israeli occupation forces when they occupied Beirut, they gave flares and everything in, to assist the fascist uh, Falangist party uh, the, to carry on the massacre. 
In 82, when the, this happened, there was a resolution that was introduced to the House of Commons uh, to denounce this massacre. And it didn't get unanimous consensus. Shows you the disgusting mentality of such politicians that we have in the House of Commons. And excuse me for saying that, but this is what it is. It's, it's really uh, uh, not just unfortunate, it uh, uh, really turns your stomach that such people won't denounce a clear massacre that happened in refugee camps uh, where the, after the PLO left Beirut and there were no arms in these camps. But th that's, that's uh, kind of gives you a, a glimpse into the uh, uh, support that Canada has been given for Israel and the Zionist project in Palestine since it was established. Uh, yeah, there, there is uh, many other things that I'd like to talk with. Uh, there is the tax deductible status that uh, Zionist organization get, and they get them freely while, uh, you know, ha hardly any Palestinian organization get this tax deductible status. Uh, many of these tax deductible status uh, go to support the IDF and to support uh, the Jewish National Fund that has uh, projects in the occupied West Bank and to the lone soldier. I think uh, people are aware of this. There is many other Zionist uh, accounts that get tax deductible status. And why? To continue with their ethnic cleansing, with their uh, uh, denial of Palestinian rights, with their confiscation of Palestinian rights, with their war crimes against the Palestinian rights. Why? We ask, everybody should ask, why this travesty? Why these Zionist organization that supports war crimes in Palestine should get these tax deductible status. Also, it's clear situation, as I mentioned before, that um, Canada's vote at the UN General Assembly is always biased against the Palestinian, more than biased, it is racist against the Palestinian. And I'd like to call uh, things with their name. It is racism against the Palestinian, what they are doing uh, at, the, uh, um, at the United Nations General Assembly. Yeah, I'll, I'll move on because based on the Canadian record at the United Nations, we opposed Canada having a, a, a seat at the UN Security Council. The, these are articles that have been published about that. And, uh, you know, uh, this, this is from the PLO Department of Public Diplomacy and Policy. They, they, uh, they tweeted our, uh, our, actually, my letter to the United Nations uh, General Assembly. Uh, they retweeted it, and you know the uh, the, uh, the representative of the uh, Canadian uh, official in Ramallah to the authority complained to the uh, PLO. Uh, it was uh, through uh, request of information. Uh, uh, that uh, Eves uh, put it in his uh, in his um, article, where uh, the uh, they they objected and they asked the PLO whether this is their true position that they oppose the the thing. But it came out really that they were concerned of our activity here. The, the, our uh, my letter was one of many people who worked on on this issue, no, no, uh, uh, 
uh, no seat, no UN Security Council seat for Canada. Uh, at the end. And in a way, we succeeded because uh, they didn't get the seat. This is a, a screenshot of what uh, the Chrystia Freeland, she was then the foreign minister, uh, stated uh, to the uh, uh, Israeli Council on Foreign uh, uh, Relations. She was in Israel uh, three years ago almost. And she stated, we know Israel is a democratic state in a dangerous neighborhood. Can you, can you believe such a racist uh, statement? Dangerous neighborhood. As if the neighborhood are the ones who are committing war crimes. As if the neighborhoods who are stealing people's homes and houses. As if this neighborhood who are ethnically cleansing people as if this neighborhood is an apartheid, the apartheid regime that we're talking about. Again, you know, that <laughs> shows the, the racist mentality of such officials. And Canada's commitment to Israel security is unwavering and ironclad. And she then, I don't know if this is herted here because we publicized this so much later on when Canada wanted a seat at the United Nations Security Council. She said, we believe our presence on the Security Council can be an asset for Israel and can strengthen our collaboration. So this is, this is the kind of uh, regime we're dealing with historically and uh, nowadays. I just like to also show that these policies I think we recommended that in our reading on this uh, website, how this really uh, affected me personally as a Palestinian. You know, uh, when I came to Canada in uh, uh, 74, I became citizen in 77, I believe, three years later, and I applied for my passport. I got two passports where my birthplace uh, stated Bethlehem, Palestine on them. The visa I entered to Canada is Bethlehem, Palestine. Uh, and, and after the Oslo process and after they gave Bethlehem to Mr. Arafat, they refused to put Bethlehem, Palestine. And then I had to deal with the issue for 19 years where I wanted to my new passport to be put on it, Bethlehem, Palestine, as my birthplace. I couldn't succeed and this was the result of the result of this booklet that I put uh, between your hands. It's on the, uh, on the uh, you know, the event uh, page. Also, another thing that affects me personally with this policy is, uh, you know, uh, I have property in Bethlehem. I have a property with houses on it. My cousin live on it. The deeds of this property is in my hand because my grandfather gave these deeds to me, to my father and then to me. My father gave them to me. I had them between my hands. I can't go back, live in Bethlehem, which is under Palestinian authority rule. I can't go live there because Israel doesn't allow me there. And what's ironic, you know, the, the, the Canada supports Israel in, in, in this position because Canada, with few other countries, three or four more other countries, the Micronesias and the small island countries, they really, uh, uh, you know, uh, support this uh, Israel on this resolution. The resolution states, and it's really... Uh, uh, passed unanimously by uh, large, large majority, except for five or six countries, including Canada. Uh, it's, it says, person displaced as a result of the June 67 and subsequent hostility. Basically, that Israel should allow these people to return to their homes. And Canada votes against. And then they tell us they want to, uh, uh, they support a Palestinian state. Uh, Canada says uh, they support a Palestinian state with, with condition, you know, which is a pie in the sky, really, this Palestinian state, because Canada always stipulates that this Palestinian state should be agreed upon 
by the two parties. That means, you know, the two parties, uh, Israel and the Palestinian Authority, should agree to this Palestinian state. And, you know, as we see from facts on the ground, Israel is not interested in, in, in giving back the occupied territory. Uh, it's clearly Israel is trying to uh, build more settlements, confiscate more land, and everybody knows that. So for the Canadian government to tell us, oh, we, wanna, uh, we want, uh, we'll, uh, um, uh, as, I, as uh, in the, in the uh, post I put earlier, that we want to, uh, we will recognize the Palestinian state when the two parties agreed upon. It's really deceptive, not just deceptive, is hypocritic because they know Israel is not going to agree to such a state. Israel made it very clear that they won't agree. It's like, you know, saying, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if a thief goes into your home and steals your computer and the judge tells you, uh, you know, uh, it's okay, uh, the, you should agree with the thief to return your computer or part of it or s some uh, elements of it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's really ridiculous, you know, to ask <laughs> that, uh, you know, the, the, th the thief to decide whether he should return the, uh, his theft or not. And this is what the Canadian government is asking us. They are put, uh, giving Israel a veto power a veto power on the outcome of uh, of the uh, ending the occupation. That's what's happening. Would they have done that in Iraq when Iraq invaded Kuwait? Please think about it. Would they have told the Saddam Hussein or the Kuwaitis, go negotiate with Saddam Hussein whether he want to give you back uh, Kuwait or not? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's really, you know, uh, an act of uh, deception, what the Canadian government is doing. This, this is my personal, so that's why I'm still here in Canada. I'm here, as I always say, not by choice. I'm here by force. My first, uh, first uh, uh, choice will be in my homeland, in my property in Bethlehem in Palestine. Uh, you know, there is many examples, even from uh, the key issue uh, uh, in 19, you know, this is the Canadian policy on, on the Middle East in 1996. They always state this same, uh, this same position that, you know, if you want a negotiated settlement, uh, you should uh, ask, uh, you know, uh, you should uh, reach a negotiated settlement with Israel. So uh, I'll just, uh, uh, you know, I'll just move a little bit. I'm not sure how, what time, how much time I have uh, because I have lots to cover. But I'll, I'll go back to the, uh, to the um, regime of apartheid. The Canadian government, uh, if they are decent or they are... Uh, truly what they say, they are for human rights and for democracy. If they are decent, they would have uh, imposed sanctions on Israel because of the apartheid nature of the Israeli state. I'll just like to uh, post something to show you uh, which countries Canada have sanctions on. And nine of those, nine of those are in the Middle East nine of those countries. It's really disgusting that they have sanctions on Yemen, while at the same time, they're giving Saudi Arabia uh, uh, Humphies to kill the children in Yemen. It's really disgusting because, you know, wh what human rights are giving. Yesterday, there was a report by the UNICEF. They're saying 11 million children need food assistance, need, need humanitarian assistance. 11 million, that's 11 million children out of the 30 million population. And then they're imposing sanctions on Lebanon. Lebanon is in dire situation now. The lira is falling and falling rapidly because of the sanctions of the US. 
The same with Iraq, with, uh, with uh, Syria, the same with uh, Iraq, the same with Libya. And these are the countries that they're imposing sanctions. The number one violator of human rights in the area, that's Israel, is not on this sanction. The number two violator of this sanction, of, uh, of uh, violator of human rights in the area, is Saudi Arabia. Where is Saudi Arabia? What kind of policy uh, we having here? And I think, you know, it's, it's really maddening because, you know, we should feel responsible for this government and hopefully election will come tomorrow and we should try to rectify these injustices, these infamies and these, uh, 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 you know, un unbelievable positions. And, and I understand why. I mean, we are a tail to the US empire. And if you notice from who is the Canada is sanctioning is exactly what the US wants. Exactly. Venezuela, North Korea, you know, you name it. I mean, I, I put the list there. And Cuba, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous. Really, Cuba is not on the list, thankfully, for his father. <laughs> I don't think he would dare do that. But, you know, I mean, Russia, China, you know, I mean, you name it. I mean, it's ridiculous. It is, it is, we are a tail to the empire and we are in service of the U.S. empire. And we should wake up and smell the hummus, as we say in Arabic, not the coffee, smell the hummus. So uh, I think that that's... Uh, that should be uh, clear. You know, CBC also, I just like to our public uh, um, affairs um, uh, broadcaster. This is the, from their guide, from their guide on Palestine. And they tell the reporters, the anchor persons, etc. So they say, so don't refer to Palestine or show a map with Palestine as a country. Use the term pro-Palestine when referring in generic ways to Palestinian supporters. This is, I, I complained uh, many times on this language and uh, the ombudsman, who's a really PR, who is a PR uh, man for uh, the CBC, he said this language is reasonable, he told me. He said this language, and it is documented, it's on our website, his letter. He said this, uh, this language is reasonable. So it fits into the denial of not just the existence of Palestine, the existence of the Palestinian people. And this is at the core of the Zionist uh, ideology. The Zionist ideology was established oh, under the slogan, a land without people for a people without land. We were invincible. We are still invincible. Till this moment, we are still invincible. If this is not racism, what is? Denying our existence. The Zionists always denied our existence. So to tell the world, oh, it was all a desert. It was, and we made it bloom, you know, which is nonsense. I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, the fertile crescent, fertile crescent included Palestine from Iraq all the way. And it used to be called fertile. It wasn't a desert. To say it's a desert is, you know, deceiving the, the, the people and uh, uh, throwing sand in the eyes of uh, human beings and to, to try to uh, fabricate history. So th this is the kind of... Uh, uh, mentality we having here, and I think I covered most things. Uh, I guess I could answer questions at the end. But my my message to you, basically, is we are as Canadian and a Canadian state in our ears in supporting war crimes and for being responsible for the tragedy of the Palestinian people. I just would like what to uh, mention one last example of this complicity. In 1949, there was a resolution that was co-sponsored by Canada. 
was co-sponsored by Canada, uh, admitting Israel to the United Nations. Uh, it's Resolution 273, if my memory serves me. And in it, uh, the, the uh, drafters of the resolution clearly stated that Israel has to abide by two conditions to be accepted at the United Nations. And these two conditions, Israel accepted between, you know, uh, uh, amongst the drafters, they said they accepted it. The two resolution was the right of return of the Palestinian people, 194, United Nations General Assembly Resolution 194. And the second one that Israel should implement the 181 resolution, that's the partition plan that Mr. Uh, Lester Pearson and Ivan Rand drafted and passed it and shoved, shoved it through our throats as Palestinians. Even that, they, they thought, you know, because Israel in 48 expanded uh, their territory from 56% to 78% of the total area of Palestine. Israel till now didn't abide by neither not by the 181, nor by the right of return of the Palestinian people. But again, that shows you that Canada's concern wasn't for the Palestinian people or the human rights of the Palestinian people. It was concerned for establishing, maintaining the state of Israel. And this is very clear to us, and it should be very clear to every decent person and every decent human being. Thank you.